Chuck. So today is March 28th, 2011, and I am in Susan Stamberg's office at National Public Radio, and Susan has agreed to um, tell us her, her story. Well, Susan, thank you very much. Sure. First, tell us, where, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Manhattan, mostly, 96th Central Park West. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a world that totally enwraps you in Jewishness. Mm -hmm. So that when I married Lou Stamper, who was from Allentown, Pennsylvania, where being Jewish was really an issue, and his father founded the temple there, then became the president of the temple there, and was insistent that we too join a temple once we moved to Washington, I said, well, why? You know, And I came to know that the entire world was not Jewish, only the world in which I had grown up in the middle of Manhattan in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to being surrounded in a, a Jewish environment, yeah. was there a Jewish education or a Jewish ritual in your home? Uh, most of these stories are f sad and funny ones mixed. Um, there was no uh, observation, no observance that I can remember in my home. No candle lighting on Fridays. I remember being taken to High Holy Days to Temple, but that was about it. Um, I was sent, however, to Jewish school at Temple Road of Sholem, a little bit down Central Park West from where we lived, and being kicked out. And the reason was that the, uh, and I was, be, I was being sent there to, for commencement, is that Confirmation. It? Thank you. You see how mm -hmm. deeply Jewish I am. Mm -hmm. And you'll see why I don't remember mm -hmm. the name of it anymore. I was sent there for confirmation. And uh, in the middle of the semester, the teacher, one Mr. Lear, said, today we're going to learn the rumba. And I raised my hand. I was a really undaunted te uh, uh, student. I just wanted to be as good as I could, study everything I can, and learn as much as I could raised my hand very politely and he said, sorry, but you know, I really didn't come here for rumble lessons. I was a little kid, the nerve. I was sent to the principal's office, first time it ever happened. My mother was called into school. How and old were we, you? Twelve, I guess, getting ready for confirmation. Maybe even a little young, mm -hmm. younger than that. Uh, because this is before bat mitzvahs, mm -hmm. you know, that became sort of the American invention of, for later generations. But I said, I'm not going to do this. This is just wrong. I was reprimanded. But my mother very nicely said, fine, you don't have to go anymore. So I never was confirmed. And do, do you feel like you were lacking in Jewish education? I don't, because I am uh, very sociologically Jewish, very ethnically Jewish, mm -hmm. although not in any particularly observant way. It's, I mean, there are a lot of people like me, secular Jews, I think is what they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel deeply Jewish, mm -hmm. and I deeply identify with my Jewishness, but it doesn't need a formal affiliation for me, I found. Although my husband insisted our boy be bar mitzvah mm -hmm. again because of that sense mm -hmm. uh, of his, his own way of feeling Jewish and the fact he came from that town where being so was truly an issue. Um, and so Josh was, was bar mitzvah and I went with him when you had to agree a certain number of years of Bible study after, and I said I would do that mm -hmm. with him, and it was a high point of my week mm -hmm. for those years in which we went, because the rabbi was quite brilliant, uh, Temple Sinai, mm -hmm. Eugene Lipman, mm -hmm. uh, who subsequently retired. Um, and and I, we left the temple at that point, too. So when you were growing up and there was no Jewish observance, I mean, I, did you go to a Passover Seder? Annually? You know, I can't remember doing that until I was an adult oh. and until I came here mm -hmm. to Washington. Again, I'm sure it had to do with my husband. Mm -hmm. I had a, a good friend in fourth and fifth grade, Ruth Salzbach, and I can distinctly re remember they were German refugees and being at her house one Friday night and watching, and this is maybe I was in fifth grade, her mother liked the candles. I thought, oh, this is so beautiful. I've never seen anything mm -hmm. like this. It was a lovely, lovely ritual, and the first time I'd seen it. And now as an adult, is there a different level of Jewish observance? No, not in my house, but I go across the street where my neighbor mm -hmm. has uh, many more uh, rituals, wonderful ones. She lived, uh, she was born here, a young, younger woman, but uh, lived in Israel for a year, mm -hmm. speaks pretty much fluent. Hebrew, as far as I can tell, is raising her daughters. I mean, that's an entirely Jewish family, all of them. But her husband, again, was sort of like me, 
not particularly observant, but raising her daughters with that sense of Jewishness. Mm -hmm. So I will go over there on a Friday mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. and uh, watch her light the candle, and I will go there. That's my temple now. Wow. I go there for Passover. I go there for High Holy Days. So it feels like home? It feels, no, not a bit like home. <laughs> my home had none of that. It feels home-y uh -huh. and family-ish. So you me. don't, do you, do you know Hebrew? Uh, no, uh, and I learned what I had to do uh -huh. uh, for Josh's bar mitzvah was all written out phonetically for me and vanished the moment the ceremony was over. Now, have you been to Israel? No, uh, yeah, for 24 hours. Uh, uh, my husband and I lived in India for a while. He worked for the Foreign Aid Agency. And uh, on our way home, after we'd been there for two and a half years, we stopped in Israel. There was a curfew. This was in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. The Al-Aqsa Mosque had been burned. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to uh, Jerusalem to stay, and there was a curfew, but we broke it and just snuck out on the streets because we knew our time there was so limited. He made several trips through his own work mm -hmm. with uh, USAID, but that was my only time at it. And, uh, Interested had, like, in going back? Uh, not particularly, no. Mm -hmm. I don't, those are not my affiliations. Mm -hmm. I don't feel, I understand that Jews need their own land. I, I understand that. But I don't, although my father was quite the Zionist mm -hmm. and did a lot to uh, raise money and worked in behalf of the Weizmann Institute uh, in Israel for him and his generation, so important. But I never really had that. I understand it all in principle, but not uh, emotionally. So growing up, did, did you have siblings? No, I'm an only child. Only child, okay. And do, do you ever think about whether there were um, Jewish values that were passed down to you from your home? I certainly feel that there were. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with that being a hardworking student. Tremendous mm -hmm. respect for the book, mm -hmm. for the written word, for the law, for multiple interpretations of things, for good discussion and argument. Mm -hmm. But, but it, this is also very generational, I think. And getting ready to uh, meet you, I just was asking myself how much was how much am I a product of my generation? First, in my immediate family to go to college, and very few others of my cousins of that level had gone first in the family. Uh, and how much is being Jewish, and how much is being a New Yorker? And it's just very, it's very hard to separate mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And the mix of people I knew, some of whom were far more observant mm -hmm. than I, and others far less. Your your parents were not college educated. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, not. Were they immigrants? No, they were not. They were born here, but they were first generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, their families were from pretty much the same uh, town, Vilnius, mm -hmm. uh, in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. Which is the, the capital of Jewish yes, capital culture. Of, at, absolutely. At but they were tradespeople. My mm -hmm. father's father was a carpenter, my mother's father a tailor, but then came here and began being a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. And she would tell me that he was the number one uh, women's coat and suit designer in New York, not bad. He worked for some big manufacturer for a certain number of years. He made a lot of money, and he bought up big chunks of the upper, way upper west side of Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. He owned buildings mm -hmm. there and then became a landlord and mm -hmm. uh, surveyed his uh, land. And I have a photograph, a family photograph of Rose Rosenberg. She was one of eight, mm -hmm. uh, all dressed up. She was seven in the picture with a big bow in her hand. She beautiful little thing. She was the baby. Uh, at the family table where we went every Sunday, all the family gathered then. Uh, and she told me at some point that was uh, a Seder picture. That was the family getting ready for mm -hmm. a Seder. So they certainly they had a kosher home and they kept. But do you have time for, uh, may I tell you one please. story that she told me from yes, when please, she of uh, was married and her uh, for, and uh, at the point at which I was born. So these were this was late thirties when she got married, and she was raised in an observant mm -hmm. home. So there were candles lit there and uh, all of that, but she never carried it out. My father too, I believe, was raised in uh, in a kosher home. I don't know how orthodox it was. I don't know what kind of Jew Jewish it was uh, on his side. But when they were first married, and when I, after I was born, they got, had a Christmas tree. And they bought a white Christmas tree with blue light bulbs. And she said, and my parents were coming to see us in our apartment. They were coming to see you. 
uh, baby Susan who had just been born. She said, I just held my breath when they would walk in and see that Christmas tree. She said, I didn't take it down because it had been our choice. Your father's in mind to have it and I you know, didn't feel like I should hide it from her. And she said, but uh, to her credit, she said, my mother never said a word. She looked around and said, what a lovely apartment, what a beautiful baby, and never said anything about that tree. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did, what, was it uh, by design or by accident that you married a Jewish man? I, I'd say it was pretty much by design. I didn't say I have to marry someone Jewish, but I never went out with anybody who wasn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, and since I traveled in that kind of world, and uh, I went to a, a very good public high school in New York, and then to Barnard College, and he, he had been at Columbia, and then uh, but I met him up in Cambridge, where we were. He was in law school, and I was in graduate school. So uh, you know, I was surrounded by in a world of really bright intellectual Jews. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a kind of person who appealed to me and did from a very young age. It's what I knew, right. what I married, yeah. and what I lived with. Yeah. So um, you attended Barnard. Yes. So, this, so you must have been a high achieving student in, in high school. Well, yes. And I feel that that was, no, not so much in high school, but hard working, mm -hmm. I'd say, hard working. And that too, I think, so that, you know, when I was telling you before, I didn't, couldn't tell how much was Jewish, how much was generational. Uh, we children of that first generation of Americans, you know, the ones born here, uh, had that deep belief in education, mm -hmm. although I didn't have that kind of pressure from my parents mm -hmm. because they had not been college. I, other parents of other friends of mine put much more pressure on their children than I ever received. Nonetheless, I was in that atmosphere in which high achievement was expected, and certainly uh, the high school, which was the high school of music and art, highly competitive, and you uh, took really stringent exams in order mm -hmm. to be able to get in, as well as have very high academic standards, and then Barnard College, which had very high expectations. Mm -hmm. So it was all there, mm -hmm. and uh, part of uh, my being was to fulfill that, to fulfill that promise, and to have confidence that I could. Mm -hmm. D did you always expect to have a career? Oh, it was expected of us, us Barnard girls. We were, our role model uh, was, uh, the president of the college was a woman named Millicent McIntosh, and she had a terrific husband, a doctor, not Jewish, she was not Jewish, <laughs> five children, all very successful, a uh, busy uh, life of uh, social action and, you know, participation, and she ran this fabulous school. And that was clearly, that was expected of all of us to do. And we did everything we could to, to imitate her and be her. And how about from home expectations? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll have to answer this. Or uh, one or the other, ignore it. Um, let me just do this. Just say, hi. Um, Let's see. Yeah, it would be nice. Is that a problem? I, I have nothing specific. I just need her to get me into a control room, you know, set me up in a private room for something, and then possibly Wednesday pull some cuts for things. Um, Wednesday we're talking about now. Oh, I'm very sorry. Tuesday we'll take ten. Uh, I'm sorry. It is now Wednesday. She's just uh, set up something at 3, but that'll, that won't take her any time at all. If I'm really efficient, it would be Thursday, Friday. I guess I should have told you all this, but it didn't occur to me. Maybe. Yeah, no, no, all clear. All clear. Thanks. Bye. I'm very sorry. That's okay. 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 I wonder how to... Maybe I'll unplug it, shall I? Gosh, it's so hot in here. I'm going to turn this off. It's awful. There's no way to control this heat. How are we doing? Good. Okay. Okay. So what was I telling you? Um, your expectations of, from my Barnard. parents' expectations mm -hmm. of me mm -hmm. through that. Um, I would say uh, all of that was really self-imposed. 
they, but they were always there helping. I mean, at night my mother would drill me with uh, on French verbs and lures and laws, and my dad, and this, and again, for his generation, was a huge gift to me, said, once I started college, I lived at home, mm -hmm. uh, that he would wash and dry the dishes every night. And that, you know, for a, a man of that generation was a big deal. Mm -hmm. But never in terms of academic pressure, I never did. I, I feel they didn't know enough, and mm -hmm. they found it a little intimidating, mm -hmm. you know? And I argued. My argues, arguments got better mm -hmm. and smarter with mm -hmm. them. And you know, there's that, you pay a certain price for edu educating your daughter that way, when you're not quite at mm -hmm. that level mm -hmm. of, of disagreement and discussion. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they put any academic pressure on me. And um, you, you know, you, you seem to be a person who's very much at ease and relaxed, and you have a fabulous sense of humor. W were you always like that? My father had a fabulous sense of humor, and was very imposing. He would walk in a room and sort of take it over. So he was kind of a performer in that way. He was a great joke teller and a schmoozer and a narrator. Um, and so I think I learned that from him. I saw that that was possible. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been. I'm not much different from how I've been all my life. I don't think so. A few more wrinkles, that's better. So, but very <laughs> self-confident self always. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, that was Barnard. Well, and it was being an only child mm -hmm. and being adored mm -hmm. by parents. You know, that goes very far. Yeah. yeah. Um, your early career, can we talk about that sure. a little bit? Uh, now, I, I read that you started out working for the New Republic. Yes, that was my first Washington job. Okay, and what were you doing for them? Typing, mostly. Uh, I didn't even have a fancy title. I mean, it wasn't even editorial assistant. I was secretary to the editor-in-chief uh -huh. at the time. But the, my big thrills were getting to create titles for book reviews <laughs> in the magazine. But I was so thrilled. I mean, that's what, uh, for women of my generation, again, we could be school teachers. I wasn't interested in that. We could get interesting jobs in publishing. That was that was it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, maybe I went into psychology. I wasn't much interested mm -hmm. in that. It never occurred to me to try. And there weren't opportunities anyway mm -hmm. for broadcasting or mm -hmm. maybe a newspaper. But I, my very first job was in Cambridge, Massachusetts for Daedalus, a very scholarly, esoteric mm -hmm. journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So the magazine world was a pretty familiar one mm -hmm. to me, and I was very glad to have that job here. And it turned out to be a great introduction to Washington, because mm -hmm. I learned here who knew what, so that when I went to the next job, which was my first radio job mm -hmm. at WAMU, as a producer mm -hmm. of a weekly discussion program, I knew who to call mm -hmm. on various themes and topics because of what I had learned at the New Room. Everything sort of built on everything else. Did we skip the weather girl? No, that was my first on-air thing, and that, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I love that you know that. That was at WAMU, and that was the day my radio debut, the day that the weather girl got on the program that I was producing, a daily program, mm -hmm. got sick. And the format called for the weather, so it was up to me to do it. And so do you have a, a memory of that first time on oh, air? Oh, total, total memory. Here's how you did it. It was very sophisticated. You picked up the phone, and you dialed WE61212. And they told you what the weather was, and you wrote it down. We didn't have meteorologists. We had, we had, there were no computers. There was no way. And there were no uh, windows in the studio. So you wrote down what they said, and then you took it into the studio, and you read from your notes what it was. But uh, I, that first day, because I also had great responsibilities producing the program, that first day forgot to call. So <laughs> I went in the studio, and the on-air mic came on. And I had no idea what the weather was. And I couldn't think of anything else to do but make it up. It was February, uh -huh. and I said it was 98 <laughs> degrees out. And I made up a barometer, and I made up a wind, something, something, something. And then the format called for it to be repeated. Uh -huh. But I was so nervous that I forgot what I said the first time. So I made it up again. Same. And no, 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 I couldn't remember. Oh, okay. So I had to put in different numbers and do all of it. But I got through it, got off, and no, we had probably two listeners, neither of them called. <laughs> Nobody seemed to know. And that, as I said, there was no window. I couldn't uh -huh. even look out. Uh -huh. to. I might have noticed it was uh -huh. snowing and uh -huh. not 98 degrees. 
but it taught me enormously important lessons. Always prepare. You don't go in the air unprepared. Mm -hmm. And two, you never lie to your listeners, uh -huh. even if they never hear you and they never call. Now, I, I also <laughs> read that, that you, you would put a poem on the broadcast. I did, I did. As the weather girl, because it's very boring uh -huh. every day. To, you know, you call and, oh, and then the real weather girl left. So that, then I took it on. You know, that was my first radio job doing the so, and it was boring. I would, I would remember to call, but it was not interesting, the answers from the weather department. So I thought, I know, because I was an English major at Barnard. I'll just to make it interesting for myself and something nice for listeners. I'll look for lines of poetry that would be appropriate on a given day to whatever the day's weather was. And I made a little file folder, and I had cloudy, warm, hot, sunny, rainy, snowy, with many, I spent hours, hours, going through all my books of poetry and whatever to find appropriate lines, and then I would just... So uh, you didn't make up the poems? Out. Well, no, but there was a, one favorite for the time, again, that I would forget to bring, the, uh, forget to uh -huh. look on, and it was, <laughs> it was Gertrude Stein. I'll recite it for you now. Mm -hmm. I have very little poetry committed to memory, but here's this. Pigeon in the grass, alas. <laughs> This is a, spr a spring poem, perhaps? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> there would have to have been, it could have worked in summer. <laughs> have to have grass. Was it love at first sight with broadcasting? It really was. Yeah. I was thrilled. It was terror and love, which are often connected. But walking in there, I mean, that was, I grew up listening to the radio, and that was, we didn't get television until I was in junior high school, mm -hmm. and I never really watched mm -hmm. it much. Uh, so it was the glamour medium of my mm -hmm. childhood, and so the chance to be able to do it. But I remember walking in there and seeing all these, to the station, seeing all these wires and cables and things you had to do, and I was thinking, what am I doing here? You know, I was an English major, I'll never understand mm -hmm. this, but I couldn't wait to learn it all. Mm -hmm. I, were you uh, influenced by the feminist movement? Of course I was, mm -hmm. oh, certainly. Um, I was, uh, we were living in India at the point when it was really ginning up here, but when we came home in 1968, that was the height of everything in this country, and we had our son in 70. And uh, I think, I feel, as many women of that generation do, that I helped to invent feminism mm -hmm. as well as under, deeply understand it in my bones. Mm -hmm. Because as Gloria Steinem used to say, the personal is always political. And so things that you thought were only happening to you, you suddenly realize were, there was this cadre of people who were experiencing the whole thing. So there must be some systemic issues. And when I started here, I started anchoring all things considered, um, very much put such issues on the air. Very, I, was, I think I was a favorite of the feminists because I paid so much attention to women's issues, women's so-called women's issues, they're everybody's issues, women's rights, family matters, elder care, you know, that whole panoply of things, as well as professional and pay, pay and all those issues that affect all of us, but in particular women. Being a, um, I consider you a pioneer in broadcasting, the first woman to anchor a, a news broadcast. Yes. Uh, and NPR was brand new at brand the time. New. Were you aware of, of, obviously you were aware that, that you were the first doing this. Did you sense there was discrimination against women? Uh, there certainly was in broadcasting at large. Here, not at all, and uh, you know, in some ways, for all the wrong reasons, we could be managers of stations and still can be in public broadcasting, uh, as I was very briefly at WMU before there was an NPR, um, and we could get top jobs. And usually, it was because the salaries were so terrible that the men couldn't stick around mm -hmm. for that long. Mm -hmm. They had family responsibilities. I. Uh, took a pay cut for my first radio job, but I was married, and my husband said, God bless you, go. You know, this is a wonderful opportunity. We had two salaries, and I was lucky to be able to do it. So women often, in similar situations, could stick around longer than the men, and so the opportunities here were wonderful mm -hmm. for us. But also I felt that burden, you know, that first women always do, to uh, do it, be do it better, do it more carefully, do it more thoroughly, mm -hmm. uh, really, than any man mm -hmm. was doing. Mm -hmm. They were so much easier about mm -hmm. uh, those daily demands, much easier than I, because I felt I had so much to prove. Mm -hmm. And did you have a mentor? 
I had, I wouldn't say mentor per se, because they weren't out there either. I had maybe a couple of role models. The other month I interviewed Dick Cavett, and I realized, although I'd, I've never met him still, I admired him enormously and would watch him on television mm -hmm. as I was starting ATC mm -hmm. and thinking, oh my goodness, look, you can be really smart and be on the air. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a revelation to me. So it was a kind of role model that way. But there were no, uh, just, that was the point at which women were hitting the job market in big numbers. Mm -hmm. And so there were very few on the air doing anything responsible. Mm -hmm. Linda Wertheimer talks about how important Pauline Frederick was to mm -hmm. her, reporting from the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Look, she, Linda says she looked her on television during the Hungarian uprising and, and said, oh, a woman can do that. You know, it was like the first time it had been possible. Nancy Dickerson, there were some of these mm -hmm. early reporters who had plumb but rare, rare, rare mm -hmm. jobs in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. But here, for that uh, variety of reasons, including the fact that there, that I was on the air and I was doing just fine, uh, and Linda too quickly uh, came on and began reporting, we could open the door to all the others, mm -hmm. to Koki, to Nina, to all the, and we were known a long time for the, our strong women and our soft men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do, do, you, do you feel like you're a role model for younger women in, broad, in broadcasting? It may be. Uh, it's so much, the, the field is so much more dispersed now. There's so much more attention to online where I'm nobody's role model. You know, it's not my medium. Mm -hmm. um, radio in that way, I'm not sure uh, the way we make it or the way I've loved making it for all of these years is, is what the future is going to be about. So I, I can't say that the first, the new ones coming in the door now would find me or Nina or any of us particularly a role model. They're doing their own thing in their own voices and in, in their own ways of expression. They're changing it. Mm -hmm. But our way of doing it, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I wanted to tell you about criticism, though, uh, and um, resistance really to uh, my that pioneering role essentially I hope it doesn't sound immodest I'm just trying to report it mm -hmm. but uh, when I first started anchoring um, and I was not told this for 11 years after the fact apparently there was quite a bit of opposition to me by uh, managers of our stations across the country they said a woman's voice doesn't carry well and she's not authoritative, and she won't be taken seriously. You can't have a woman anchoring the news. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the man who was running things then, Bill Seamring, who was the one who decided I should be uh, the anchor, and, um, and also was an inventor, the major conceiver of all things considered, never told me. He told me that story mm -hmm. 11 years later. Mm -hmm. And I know, he, he didn't tell me this, but I know it because I know him, that he didn't tell me at the time for a number of reasons. One, he knew it would affect mm -hmm. who I was on the air, and mm -hmm. he wanted me to be myself mm -hmm. and just keep at it. And two, he felt if I did that long enough that the, the uh, criticism would die away. And in fact, uh, in fact, it did. I think there was probably this much truth to it, uh, and that is that we were broadcasting then on really bad quality telephone lines, 5KC mm -hmm. lines. And they tend to dampen down, they, they boost up the, sh the shrill end of a sound spectrum and dampen down the deeper end. And so it would distort and change your voice some. Mm -hmm. But our lines got better. <laughs> uh, do you want, would you talk about the family career balance, the work-home balance? Yes. Uh, it, it was never right. I never got it right in all that time, and I think any working mother, anyone terribly involved in a job they care about pretty much as passionately as they do about their child and their husband, and I have to be honest with this, would tell you exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, that you're always putting something on a back burner, mm -hmm. especially raising a young child. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was the constant motion of the day. My husband was wonderful mm -hmm. in this. He was so supportive, and we would, if Josh got sick, uh, I'd stay home in the morning, with him, and then Lou would come home in the afternoon so I could come and be on the air. You know, he would mm -hmm. share in that way until we uh, got stabilized and got good, solid child care, but it doesn't keep you away from your child. Mm -hmm. But I feel always there was that. There was 
um, and with so many children now, that that absence of 100% attention to anything, to any one thing, because always in the corner of your mind is the other thing that's mm -hmm. just waiting there for mm -hmm. you. So that was very, very tough. Mm -hmm. Luckily, he's a grand boy. <laughs> he's a terrific oh, boy. Well, my son. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He turned out okay. Um, probably not. Not just luck. Um, <laughs> now you've. I know. You've. I've heard you say that men and women use language differently. Yes. Do you think that affects the way you approach a story that you're doing for the radio? Yeah, I don't know if it's language. And by the way, that's not original with me. I learned it from my friend Deborah Tannen, mm -hmm. who wrote that wonderful mm -hmm. book. She's somebody you ought to talk to. You know, I hope she's on your list, and I can help you if you like. Okay. Uh, uh, you just don't understand. Mm -hmm. And she writes about how differently men and women use language, that women, to women, language is the glue of relationships. We talk in order to connect. For men, it tends to be more of a weapon, that is, in, of a competition for authority in whatever the situation may be. So it'll, there'll be a contradiction, there'll be a quick answer to something, there'll be a declarative, simple declarative statement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she's spot on mm -hmm. so many, so much. Now, men have changed since she wrote that, and, but they have. I think feminism has done a lot for men. <laughs> so I don't know how, how uh, much it is true now. But certainly, uh, f I think it's true for me. I would tend to ask questions far more than make declarative mm -hmm. statements, and that's handy mm -hmm. in work like mm -hmm. mine. And now, at, at this point in your career, you're a special reporter for NPR. Yes. So do you get to pick the stories that you want to do? I do. I'm very lucky. What inspires you to, you know, you're curious about this or this or, or this? Where, how do you pick? Well, I always trust my curiosity. I always have all my life. Um, it was sort of, I always felt it was part of my job description as, as an anchor, be curious about everything. You know, that name, All Things Considered, is, uh, we took it quite seriously. And I, it's something I did naturally anyway, and so I found the f perfect place to exercise it. Mm -hmm. And I continue that way. I Look, I'm getting older. I'm not uh, curious about everything anymore. So uh, that makes me listen even more carefully inside to the things I am curious mm -hmm. about, because then I can go and mm -hmm. make that my story. Mm -hmm. But just name it. I mean, anything that sounds odd and quirky. I did a piece the other day, a wonderful exhibit here at the National Gallery uh, of, of Gauguin paintings. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, Gauguin, you know, I've seen a lot of Gauguin, I'm not a big fan, uh, but I've never done a story about him. And I started reading and see that the curator here's take on it, mm -hmm. actually it's from the Tate in London, uh, is a, a biographical one about his life and all of these exotic uh, visions of Eden that he created there were completely manufactured by him because what he found was a colonialized by the French missionaryized, no more bare-breasted ladies. They were forced by the missionaries to cover up with very unattractive gowns. So he just made it up. He didn't find it. He made it up. And as I asked the curator, look, isn't that the artist's job? I mean, they make up things, they look at things, and they make up their visions of it. She said, yes, but the problem was he kept sending those pictures home and saying this was really what it was like there. <laughs> so do, do you have any, any sense of um if you look at all the work, your, your, the body of work, that this is really a, a picture of America. I mean, that's that's how I, how I see it. Do you, I wonder if you see it. The I same certainly way. think the work of, to, that National Public Radio mm -hmm. has done since its beginning 40 years ago and through today is absolutely a picture, not just of America, of the world. As we get more and more expanding our coverage overseas. Uh, in particular, oh yes, my my piece of it is not at all. It certainly was when I was on the daily program and having to look at everything and sort of talk about what had happened in the world that day and in this country, particularly that day. Now, no, I think mine is the icing on the cake. It's the thing you get to do after you've heard all the horrible news. I give a little treat. Well, I, I, I for one appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, what, do you. Do you want to comment on what, what you see as the future of radio? Of radio? Mm -hmm. Well, Radio, in my heart, will always have a future. Um, sound will always have a future. The form of it, you know, a box you put on the table, the box that was on my kitchen table as a little girl, the box that Bob Edwards talked about that sat in the corner of his living room and he always wanted to crawl inside it and be that man. 
those that that's not part of the future anymore. You do a, a focus group with twenty somethings and you say who here has a radio and not no hands go up. Mm -hmm. They don't even think about the mm -hmm. radios in their car. Mm -hmm. So it will be iPods mm -hmm. and those other ways of downloading through computers sound, mm -hmm. sound files, which are still will be very important, but into funny little buds mm -hmm. that you put in your ear, all of that. Sadly, I, I think that's the future, and there are huge losses mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, are you ever surprised at what people will reveal to you when you're speaking with them? Um, huh. I'm just trying to think. Uh, I'm sure I have been. I'm just uh, trying to think of examples in which... Uh, or maybe in general? Yeah, not always. Uh, not always. It's not so much my goal is to get big revelations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as it has been to get people to really engage in thought with me mm -hmm. uh, over microphones. Mm -hmm. That's different. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, it's a different kind of journalism that I've always mm -hmm. practiced and certainly that we practice here mm -hmm. at NPR. We're not into gotcha and we're not into... Uh, that celebrity stuff where you just want people weeping for you. I used to always turn my microphone, my tape recorder off when people began to cry. Mm -hmm. I felt, felt it was a terrible invasion mm -hmm. of privacy. Uh, I don't feel that way anymore. Mm -hmm. So much in the world has changed. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, I suppose I'm surprised, but that wouldn't be my lead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is there any story that you've done that's particularly meaningful to you or memorable? There must oh, be many. There are so many, but the one that just leapt to mind was uh, Miss Lily Sanasi. She just seemed emblematic to me of of a grand world and, and in a way, my working life. I stumbled on her uh, sitting in a park bench in the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. I was getting off a bus and I was going through the park to get to uh, a friend's apartment. And I see on a bench sitting in a pork pie hat over her uh, forehead and old, you know, pants and a nice windbreaker, perfectly proper lady, gray-haired, holding a sign on her lap. And it says, uh, Parlons-nous. Parlons and on the other side, in English, let's talk. So, and there, there were a few people sitting, uh, had pulled up chairs to her. So I went and said, what are you doing? And she said, well, you know, I'm just sitting here and inviting people to come and have conversations with me. And I do this every time I'm here or wherever I am, I carry my son. And I said, well, you know, I, uh, that's what I do for my work. That's sort of my career. I talk with strangers and invite them to have conversations. She said, wouldn't you like to interview me then? <laughs> and I said, talk to myself. Would lobsters wish to fly? So we made a date, and I came back the next day and with my tape recorder and uh, interviewed her. And she was 80-something at the time, lived in Brussels, was visiting Paris. Wherever she goes to a public place, she carries that sign. If she's waiting online to get into a theater, she's got her sign, and she holds it up. If she's sitting on the bench in Paris, she holds it up. And people come and talk to her. And they have wonderful exchanges. She has uh, a few, very few rules. We will not discuss religion or politics, she says, because that way wars begin and so do arguments. And that's not what we're here for. And you don't have to tell me your name. It can be completely anonymous. And let's just have a chat. And she believes that the world would be a better place if there were chatters places as well. She says, we make room for smoking, you know, but <laughs> find outsourced outside space for people who smoke. Why don't we find designated spaces outdoors where people can just talk to each other? And while I was there, people came, people left, they sat down, utterly unselfconscious, talked about the day's news, politics, the flowers in the park, a book they were reading, help with language translation, something, just this wonderful interchange. And I thought this is Fabulous. This mm -hmm. was like a gift to me, this mm. woman, opening herself mm -hmm. this way. It was great. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you, what, what is the, the greatest satisfaction of your career? I know you were um, nominated or admitted into the Radio Hall of Fame. That oh, must yeah. have been a treat. Those are all nice uh -huh. surprises, and those are all very nice. Uh, but satisfaction is seeing through the process. I think it's every aspect of a process from the very first, I mean for a story, first, very first idea, 
to doing the research, lining up the people. I'm in the middle of it now, it's for a sad uh, reason and a little ghoulish, but uh, Andre Previn has not been well, and we bank here mm -hmm. obituaries. Mm -hmm. So I was asked to prepare that, and here I am having a wonderful time reading his books and listening to tapes from times when he was on NPR with me and with others. And I, every second of this process I really love. And then tomorrow I'll interview a film critic about him, and then I'll start to find music and put all that together and write it and, and have it on the radio. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the most satisfying, mm -hmm. and pleasing people with it. I think that's important too. Do you see anything Jewish in the in the storytelling that you do? There's this whole, so many stories in the Jewish tradition of storytelling, whether it's interpreting the Bible or yes. just Hasidic tales. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I think that all of that is very Jewish, the telling of stories, but also the seeking of opinions and the being open to the range of opinions that's out there and also feeling sometimes mine's right. <laughs> That's very Jewish. <laughs> uh, over the the years of your, your career, and this is my my last question. Okay. You've met people from all over the world and all walks of life. Is there anything you could say that you have have learned from all of the people that you have met? Learned about people? Um, I think maybe the biggest lesson, and uh, the last time I counted, and this was oh maybe twenty years ago. I'd done something like 30,000 interviews, so I don't know how many I've done now, by now, this long afterward. I think the greatest lesson is staying open, staying open to life and ideas. Uh, as I get older, that gets harder sometimes, so I have to uh, put, put myself in a position to remind myself to do that more. But staying open to possibility, that's, I, that's a wonderful lesson. And it's been behind pretty much every person I've met. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You prepared, you prepared so beautifully. Well.